good morning, everybody. Man, oh man, am I excited to see all of you. Wasn't worship wonderful this morning? So good to see everybody. Listen, thank you again and again for all that everyone did through prayer and service yesterday. The church looks phenomenal. It was not easy to watch all of you work like crazy, but somehow I was able to pull that off. And for any of you who are new this morning wondering what that's about, the only thing I can just about fix or build is a Lego set. So that's about it. But they did amazing work. Now what we're going to talk about today is old habits. We have old habits, whether we want to admit that or not. And usually when we speak about old habits, and you hear a preacher start talking, usually they start talking about addiction things, and then somebody in the audience usually kind of slinks down low, hoping they wouldn't see them. But stay with me today, because not only are we going to talk about those things that just hinder us like addictions. By the way, just to put everybody on the same playing field, it seems to be universally understood that alcohol and nicotine are probably the number Number one and two addictions. But folks, I don't know if you know this, but there's a nice long list. You can find it just about anywhere. You can be addicted to just about anything if you should so choose. And the list goes on. There is illegal drugs, caffeine. Well, then I read that and I had to stop because as soon as I did, you know, some of us think about my coffee habit. So we left that alone, right? Prescription meds, there's sex addiction, food, gambling, well then food, and then I got stuck again. You see what I mean? It just hit me left and right. But there's gambling, there's internet, there's modern technology, screens, video games, work, sleep, money, shopping. You can go on and on and on. And see, truly told that usually when someone shares about their addiction, what happens is it's tempting for people like, for instance, non-alcoholics, that when they hear their story about someone's life and their struggle, And how they committed their life to the Lord and they were rescued by God. It's tempting that you say, well, I can't relate and somehow I'm detached from all this. But listen to me. I think you'd be amazed to find out the level of your depth of depravity. In other words, how bad you can truly be. We're not innocent people. And just because you may not be able to relate to something going on in somebody else's life doesn't mean that you don't have your own log. In that statement, I want you to understand a few things. For those of us who haven't struggled with those things, we understand there's just one perfect person, and that's Jesus. So what is it that makes some Christians different than others? In the pulpit digest, that's right, there is such a thing. I got this illustration, I thought it was pretty clever. Philip Hale went to a little village in France. A town, and when he began to research this town, it was unlike others in France because they hid all their Jews from the Nazis. He went there wondering, what sort of courageous people were these? Were these ethical heroes that risked life and limb just to do this extraordinary good? So he interviewed these people wanting to know what was so different about them. He found that they were absolutely ordinary people. That they weren't heroes and they weren't smarter than other people in France. And Hale decided that there was one factor that seemed to unite them. It was their attendance Sunday after Sunday at this little church where they heard the sermons of the preacher. And over time, they became people of habit who knew just what to do and did it. When it came time to be courageous in the days of the Nazi, you might ask, what is it that they did? Well, one old woman faked a heart attack as soon as the soldiers entered, so when the Nazis came to take care of her, the Jews snuck out the back door. She went later when she was interviewed. She said, Pastor taught us that there comes a time in life where every person is asked to do something for Jesus. When our time came, we just knew what to do. So let's pray this morning. As we begin to learn, not just of what God expects of us, but that as John even mentioned, when we leave and worship today, that we know what to do and then we do it. Would you bow your heads with me? Father in heaven, we love you. And we thank you so much for all that you did. And so God, I know there's prayer requests today. There are those that need healing. Special touch from you. Their hearts need to be calm and peace has been requested. And so, Father, as we look at Your Word, our prayer is that You'll change us from the inside out. And so, thank You, God, for saving us 
and taking care of us. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. This morning, we are continuing to look at the cross. We're continuing to talk about resurrection. And so here's some things. Old habits are an easy thing to slide back into regardless of the cross. We don't like to talk about it in those ways. In fact, the truth is, we believe many a time, once you meet Jesus, we ought to just be perfect. Or it ought to be easy. And things ought to leave us like crazy. But that doesn't really happen. Like the story that we shared, when it, times to be, when it comes time to be courageous, the truth of the matter is that it takes courage just to do God's will much less to make some big proclamation. And so, here's what happened in Galatians chapter 2. I want you to turn there with me and look at verse 8 and on. Like this area of Scripture, Paul had a choice to make. Would he stand up and do what was right, or would he sit back and just let old habits grow? Paul is talking about the Lord. And he's talking about the Lord working with the apostles in the life of Paul specifically. In 8, he says, For he, that's the Spirit, who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship of the circumcised, also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, which is Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles, and they to the circumcised. They desired that the only thing we should also remember is the poor, the very thing which I was eager to do. The table is set. Now, that's the beginning part of it. This is what happened. James, Peter, John, they're leading pillars. And so, among these disciples, once they spent time with Paul, once they spent time with Barnabas, they are now sending them to the Gentiles. And their calling into the ministry has now been confirmed. And so, a wonderful game plan. It seems that in verse 11, though, we see some old habits of Peter starting to show up. I know that many of us don't ever want to experience things like a slide back. You would hope this morning, as a way of, again, encouragement, you would hope that you would never be tempted to get back into old habits. It does happen. But once you're made aware of them, what do you do with that? Do you remain as you are? Or do you change for the glory of God? So when Peter shows up, this is what happened in verse 11. Peter had come to Antioch. Paul said, I withstood him to his face. Because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. And when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Why does old habits come back? Here's your first point this morning. It's an easy one, but if you'll listen, if you'll write this down and take it to heart, it'll help you. Fear. Fear usually brings back old habits. It doesn't matter what those old habits, old addictions, old sins, old temptations, whatever it might be, fear usually precedes this. Even after the cross, you might be willing to return to old habits, even if you think they're good ones. Apparently, sometime after the important conference, what John mentioned in Sunday school was spot on. You missed a great lesson if you weren't there. In Acts 15, they all gathered together. Peter came from Jerusalem to Antioch. The first thing that Peter realizes is the freedom he had at that time. In Acts 15, and this is my thing, if you've ever been here before, you know usually every sermon we're going to talk about Jesus and something food related. Amen? Oh, come on now. So here's the deal. John told us in Sunday school that I can no longer, no longer just talk about people who eat vegetables even though I don't. All right? I got the lesson, John. If you're listening, I know you are. So here's the thing, the humor side of it. You ready? Here's the beauty aspect. When Peter got together in Acts 15 with all the believers, nothing was off limits. He had such freedom. It's a lot like when you would go to these conferences. And for those of you who would never raise your hand and worship here at our church, but you go to a conference or you go to a concert and your hand goes up. 
It's amazing how nobody will make a noise, but you go to a ball field, you'll scream your head off, right? There's a lot of freedom there, and that's what Peter experienced. Now, when he came there, he realized that he could enjoy fellowship with all the believers, Jews and Gentiles alike. And to eat with the Gentiles did mean that it's accepting. If I eat with you and share a meal with you, I'm partaking with you, I'm laughing with you, we're in it together, wouldn't you agree? And so it was a good day to be a part of the church in Acts 15. However, old habits came back to Peter. He was raised an Orthodox Jew. And so he had a difficult time learning this lesson of freedom. You might think that just because Jesus taught this lesson of freedom, and just because the Holy Spirit had re-emphasized it later on, that Peter would never struggle with this again. But he did. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, if I walked with Jesus, I just would have absorbed it like a sponge. But like most of you, you can be taught all kinds of lessons. It's whether or not you accept the teaching and follow it. That's what makes the difference. Most of you as parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins, bosses, the like, you have told people what to do in life. But not everybody listened to your teaching. They had a choice to make. And so what happened with Peter is that we learn lessons can be taught. So listen to me, teachers. If you're frustrated that nobody seems to be listening to you fully, Welcome to the life of Jesus, Peter, Paul, James, John, and all the others in between. Can you agree with that? So here's what happened. Peter had been taught that Jews and Gentiles were the same in Jesus Christ. But as soon as James sent some men to him, he started treating the Jews one way and the Gentiles another way. So what led to him taking this step back in his faith? Fear. Fear usually brings back old habits. Was Peter always full of this fear? No. He had freedom at one point, which means he chose to live in this life of fear. So listen to me, those of you today that have struggled in the area of fear. Maybe you're afraid this morning and you came this morning. You're full of so much anxiety and struggling in beside. You have a choice to make today. Are you going to begin handing that burden of fear over to the Lord? Or are you going to take it home with you and let fear dictate the things you say, the things you do, and where you go? You see, church, Peter had not been afraid to obey the Spirit when he was with Cornelius. He wasn't afraid to give a public testimony at this conference in Acts 15 about what God was doing. But now, just because some Orthodox Jews showed up that had become Jesus believers, but thought that everybody needed to follow the Old Testament ways of doing things, Peter lost his courage. It's rough when we allow others to change us. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a lot easier to be brought down than it is to bring somebody up. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord will be safe. Many have asked over the last several years why some people operated certain ways and why some others didn't. It depends on what they're going through. But for some, they refuse to let fear dictate their life. We have elections coming up. We're not afraid of who gets elected. Why? Because God is in charge. We've got all kinds of neat things in the hopper of life. Because God is in charge, not us. And so, even though Peter had studied the Old Testament, he forgot that true safety was found in the Lord. So how do we account for this fear even in our life? Like Peter, we are tempted to go back to old habits, and many do. For one thing, Peter was an impulsive man. Do you find yourself that way? Is there a rack at the grocery store that you can't pass by without buying something? Does everything look like a good deal for you, even if you own 12 of that same kind? Maybe you have some impulsiveness. In Peter's life, he could show amazing faith one minute. Listen, he walked across water. But as soon as he had fear, he plummeted down. Peter 
told Jesus at the living Lord's Supper that we call it, right? The Last Supper. Man, I'm going to die for you. I'm going to live for you. Later on, He denied. You see, impulsive people tend to live life on a roller coaster. Now, if that's you this morning, it can either be a thrill ride or you can get scared to death. It brings destruction. Peter life was such a beautiful testimony because what we learn is that Peter's fear led to Peter's fall. Why is fear something we have to address today? Because of what happened to Peter. See, fear made him a hypocrite. We like to talk about how we try not to be hypocrites. And if you find people outside the church, they probably say that the church is full of hypocrites. The answer is, yes, We are. Because every way is right to me, the Bible says. But if somebody else does something different, I think they're wrong. If you don't believe me, just watch the news for about 30 seconds. We believe we're right and somebody else is wrong. But see, fear led to Peter's fall. And because he became a hypocrite, Peter pretended that his actions were motivated by faithfulness when in reality they were dividing the church. How easy it is to use Bible doctrine to say that we can be disobedient. There are people in churches today who cover up their disobedience in God by making the church something that it wasn't supposed to be. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not a club. We're not a government agency. We're not guided by a social agenda. We are saved by Jesus and filled with His Spirit. And our goal is to do God's will, not our own. Not for us to use the Bible to put people under a law, but to show them the grace of Jesus Christ. Now the second tragedy is that Peter led others astray with him. Misery loves company. And if I can do it wrong, I want you to do it wrong with me. That way I'm not all by myself. You see, even Barnabas was involved, it says in Scripture. Barnabas had been Paul's assistant. He's one of the spiritual leaders of the church. And so here's his disobedience. And then what happened is, it was going to be a tremendous influence on the entire church when you have Paul's assistant and Peter all leading the church back into the law. Now suppose Peter and Barnabas' actions... Suppose Paul hadn't told them that this was wrong. Perhaps they had an opportunity to lead the church in legalism. Legalism is attractive and easy. Do you know why? Because it gives me a checklist I can follow. In the morning, I woke up and I did my prayer thing. Check. I did my Bible thing. Check. I called five people. Check. I did all these things and I even came to church. Praise God. Look at me. Thank you very much. Right, everybody? That's legalism. And then also, do you know what else is legalism? It's that spiritual police. You shouldn't have said that. Shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't have gone to that place. Some of you grew up in that type of household. Your parents were more military Christians than they were grace Christians. I'm seeing a few nods, so apparently I wasn't the only one that grew up that way. But here's the difference in something that you have to completely understand is that if Peter and Barnabas had gotten away with leading the church to this, can you imagine what the church would look like? Instead of, dear people, we are sinners in need of Jesus Christ and His forgiveness. It would have gone to, you better or else. Do you guys respond well to ultimatums? I don't know a fella or a lady in this room that would probably respond real well to that. If you don't do this, just saying, you know, it's going to be bad for you. You see, Jesus had one thing to say is that it's His way, not our way. He's the only way to the Father, not our actions. You see, you can see that this problem It wasn't a matter of personality. It wasn't a matter of what camp, you know, do I need to do this or don't do that? It's a question of the truth of the gospel. And Paul was prepared to fight it. So the real issue is, are you willing to tackle the fear in your life? Or are you going to sit back and let fear have control? Now in verse 14, this is what happened. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth, 
it says, of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of the Gentiles and not as of the Jews, why do you compel the Jew, uh, Gentiles to live as the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not of the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Now, for those of you who are not Bible scholars, don't get lost just for a minute. Stay with me. It actually is a lot simple. Here it is. You ready? Point number two. We usually don't think our old habits are bad. Because here's why. Peter was a Jew. But through faith in Christ alone, he became a Christian. And because he was a Christian, he's part of the church. And in the church, there's no racial distinctions. There's no Jew and Gentile. There's only one church. And so what was Paul challenging Peter on? He was challenging Peter's beliefs in the law and his actions regarding the unity of the church. Now, Paul's words had to have stung Peter because here's what he said. You're a Jew and you've been living like a Gentile. And now you want the Gentiles to live like Jews. What kind of contradiction, what kind of hypocrite are you becoming? Now you'd think that Peter wouldn't have done, or excuse me, Peter wouldn't have done this since Peter himself had stated at the Jerusalem conference that nothing's off limits. We can do all these kinds of things together. There's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. But now Peter is putting on this huge difference, and God's people, because they're one people, Paul had a problem with what he was doing. Peter was trying to divide people into groups, or at least bring them back into an old group. Today you think, well, I'm good. I don't treat anybody any different. I get along with everybody if I can. But here's the interesting part. Listen, church, this isn't just about treating other people differently. This is about the unity of the church. Old habits come back in our lives like gossip, pride, worry, holding grudges, lack of forgiveness, lack of faith. They do more damage to you, to your family, to the church family than you'll ever be able to fully comprehend. There are too many Christians today that think they're helping God out or they're being righteous by sharing information that isn't theirs to share. It's called gossip. And they even do so with prayer requests. I used to do this to Jenny as a game when we would do youth. Jenny, I've got a prayer request. It's a juicy one. There's not a soul in this room who goes, I'm willing to pray right now. What is it? Pride is something that grieves the Spirit of God in our lives. It causes so many to go to stray. Dear brother, and I've been talking more and more about this. In fact, what we've learned is that pride causes you to put more faith in themselves instead of God. And then they get hurt or they begin to hurt others when things don't go their way or the way they've planned. I cannot tell you how many times I've had big plans and when they didn't come together the way I wanted, that I got upset. Do you feel me, ladies and gentlemen? Do you understand that part? Do you know what that is? It's not just disappointment. It's pride. My way must be the best way. And then when it doesn't go my way, I pitch a fit. You would think I wouldn't, but I do. Now there's Christians. There are husbands and wives. There's families. There's work associates who try to punish someone in their life by holding grudges against someone in hopes that they will notice the cold shoulder or will correct their behavior. There are so many marriages. They're not breaking up because someone's cheated. They're breaking up because they don't even talk. They hope they can ruin each other by fixing each other that way. I said that backwards. Let me say it again. You ready? They hope they can fix each other by ruining each other. Did y'all catch that one? That was a lot better. That sounded better in my mind. Let me do it again. You ready? Third time is a charm. There are people here today. There's people at home today. There's people you work with that hold grudges towards one another just because they think their way is better. And if I can give them that cold shoulder, it'll fix them. 
I've never in all the years of counseling have I had a married woman, married husband come to my office and go, I am so glad they didn't talk to me for three months. I'm so much a better person today. I have never had that. And if that's your testimony, can we please talk about that later? Okay, here we go. Christians. There are Christians who aren't forgiving one another. Perhaps you feel this morning, when you read about the conflict that Paul and Peter had, perhaps you're thinking today that somebody was wrong and they should have asked for forgiveness. Well, what are their thoughts? What are they thinking? What's going on in their life? Perhaps somebody will come to their senses. And in some of your cases... You don't get asked forgiveness one time. You're a person who wants to be asked for forgiveness a hundred times before you think they are contrite enough. Let me paint for you a picture. You ready? I did not always follow the rules. I know that comes as a surprise. Withhold your gasp. When I was in school, I was habitually late to the things I did not want to be on time for. Can y'all relate to that? Okay. So in showing up late, one time, I strategically manipulated the circumstances that I would miss an early run. For those of you who like to run, you could probably tell by my physique, I think feet that run are headed towards evil. But I can't prove that. But I am not a runner. Now, having said that, I missed a run when I saw my coach He informed me that I had missed something by being tardy, and the illustration was simple. I needed to show how contrite I was. For the remaining of the practice, every words out of my mouth, all the phrases that were there, were, sorry coach, I was late. I had to say it in front of the team. I had to say it in front of the coach. I had to say this. And each time he would follow that up by saying, see, if Jared's late, everybody thinks they can be late. And then I was a public example, right? So I had to say, sorry, coach, I was late. Sorry, coach, I was late. Sorry. Do you know how old that gets, by the way? But ladies and gentlemen, some of you have treated God that way. You think maybe God is withholding forgiveness from you because your mama or your daddy did. Some of you are treating God that way because your spouse does that to you. But that's not the way God operates. God says once you've asked for forgiveness, He gives it fully and completely. There's no earning nature there. You don't have to keep coming back to the cross saying, I'm sorry for the thing you forgave me 25 years ago. Or last week, He forgave you. And the problem is that some people have grown up withholding forgiveness. They have forgotten that if they don't forgive, that God won't forgive them. Let me say that again. If you don't forgive, God won't forgive you. And that is a problem because it's causing division in the church. As tempting as it may be to tell people in order to avoid the old habits in your life that you just need to follow the law of God more closely. You know what that looks like? A lot of people will say this one. In order for me to be a much better person, I just need to follow every single word in here. Listen, the the Holy Bible is perfect. But we're not. And if you follow every single word in here, and I hope and I want to encourage you to follow His word as close as you can, but some of y'all have some right hands and y'all should have cut those things off a long time ago. Some of you should have had your tongues removed. Now I'm going to stop right there to simply put it like this. We need the grace of God, not the law of God. He wants your heart your life not just to sacrifice and go got my checklist I'm good Jesus died on the cross for us he came back to life for us he doesn't need your help but let's go into detail you ready Paul reminds us that we weren't saved by following the law we were justified we're saved by faith in Christ 
If Galatians was the first book that Paul wrote, and I think it does, this is the first appearance of this important word called justification. Now, if you're new today, I don't often get the opportunity to talk about big words, so I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Y'all okay with me? It's like this. Here's justification by faith. This is the catchphrase of the Reformation. It's also important that we actually understand this doctrine. Justification. For some of you over life, and as you get older, there might be this temptation. Do I really know Jesus? or do I not? Is this what happens and all? Some of you have even said this before. There has been such and such who used to go to a church and now they don't. Well, they weren't really saved. Let me put something out there. You ready? Here's the beauty part about Jesus and the gospel. You're either saved or you're not saved. There's no third category called really saved. Oh, come on now. That was really funny in my notes. I had that all written down. That was as good as my jokes go. There's just the two categories. Now, here's justification of faith. Why is this important doctrine, you might ask? Because this was so troubling. You see, in the book of Job that so many of you have read about trials and tribulations, Job had this to say. How can a man, in verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 2, how can a man be righteous or just before God? How can we? I can't. I promise you, I have tried to follow all kinds of things. Do you know what it really created in me? Pride. I'm so glad I'm like me and not like other people. It created pride in my life. But I still wasn't righteous. It's a vital question because it goes through all of eternity. So what was God's answer? It's simple in a backing. The just shall live by faith. You either live life by faith or you don't. There's no third category there. And so these old habits that we're talking about today, this is what set Martin Luther aside and from this religious bondage and this fear as he started living life in faith in Christ alone and not in a checklist, not in works, not in I better or else's. That's not the way he lived life. It's so important to understand this concept, this doctrine of justification. Why? Because it's featured in three of our New Testament books. Romans, Galatians, Romans, which John's been going through in Sunday school, and the final one is Hebrews. You see, what's justification? Romans explains the area of being just. Galatians says this is how we shall live. And Hebrews is all about faith. And so God says this. Justification is the act whereby He, being God alone, declares a believing sinner righteous in Jesus Christ. God alone. Every word of that statement is so important. Why? Because justification, it's an act. Salvation, it's an act. It's not a process. It's not a process. It's not make ten more payments and this salvation thing's mine. I got to attend every service or else. Now listen, you never thought you'd ever hear a Baptist preacher say that you could take one service off. But here's your service. Write this down. Y'all ready? It's going to be on a Thursday. No, listen to me. Oh, that's right, crafty ladies. No Christian is more justified than someone else. You're not going to go to heaven and then somebody's got some big whopping thing and you're living in the outhouse. That's not the way that's going to work. Romans 5. Verse 1 says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you came this morning and peace is some of the farthest thing from you because you've added law to your life and you're not satisfied. You begin to lose your joy. You don't have peace in your life because things aren't working out the way you planned. You don't have peace in your life because you took your eyes off the cross and you put them on every other situation in life. And so what's happened to you is that you've become a, this huge clanging symbol. Listen folks, since we're justified by faith, you need to know that is instant. It happens immediately. 
As soon as you profess your faith in Jesus Christ, as soon as you make that statement in Him, it isn't an ongoing process in which you have to do all the right things and then you might lose it. There is no losing salvation. God saved you. You didn't save you. I'm going to say that again because there's some this morning that have come. They might be watching on the screen and they think they've done something so bad that God somehow doesn't love them as much as He did the other day. God loves you so much that He gave His Son for you and He has declared you righteous in the name of Jesus, not in the name of you. You didn't save you. And you can't lose it. This is why we no longer have to be afraid. This is why we don't have to bring back some of those old habits. We've been justified. As excited as you ought to be when your team scores in the last second. As excited as you are when that steak that you cooked just came out just right. Shouldn't you be so much more excited to know that you're going to heaven? Shouldn't you be excited to know that this is not at the end of the story? This is not as good as it gets? Ladies and gentlemen, this is why we don't have to slide backwards. This is why we don't have to live in fear. Because we're saved. And so Paul explains this later on. But the law was given so that it would reveal how sinful we are. If you want to know how bad I am, then all you got to do is just point out where I've broken everything. There's all kinds of laws I've broken in life. Haven't you? There's not a person in this room, I would imagine, that hadn't told a lie. There isn't a person in this room who probably hasn't done a gossip thing. And I bet you, and I'm willing to say that, you're right? Didn't I just say I bet? Some of y'all right now go, look at the preacher's gambling. Everybody in this room has pride. And it has cost you dearly. Ladies and gentlemen, God in His grace put our sins on Christ. And because He did that, Christ's righteousness has been poured out on us. It's been credited to our account. So today, before we continue on and finish up completely, there might be some of you who might wonder, are you, am I justified or am I not? I mean, I say I believe in Jesus. For the record, so does Satan. For the record, so does demons. They all believe in Jesus. Nobody's disputing Jesus. But you do need to know something. In justification, God declares that the believing sinner is now righteous. He does not make him righteous. Which means this. The sin nature is still there. So for some of you today that are going, I've just constantly tempted. I've been for 30 years, I've struggled with this. Before you go crazy trying to beat yourself up, you do need to understand this. Sin nature doesn't leave you. But because the Holy Spirit is in you, you have a way to escape the sin. Justification, in a perfect way, would do this. Years ago, um, this may surprise you, maybe not, depends. I used to have a bad mouth. Why do I say that? It's an easy one to confess. Everybody in the room will be like, well, me too. Ha <laughs> ha. But here's the deal. I, I thought to be a growing boy, I would talk like all the other grown boys. Y'all understand what I mean? So I was out on the golf course one day. It wasn't just putt-putt that I played. I missed the shot. I was embarrassed that I missed the shot. And I decided to do, and I'm so thankful we didn't have cell phone videos back when. My club went, and so did my mouth. And in all of that, my public example was simple. I said what I said, and I meant what I said. I was mad and frustrated. I justified it all over the page. Y'all ever been there? I've done it. And so here's what happened. When I accepted Jesus, you would think immediately, I would never say another bad word. Well, here I was, 30 years old, I was in the store. And as I'm there, having already served in the church for 12 years, I was holding something. Somebody came around a corner, scared me to death. Do you know what I said? Don't say it. 
Actually, I said, praise God, and I just, uh, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. I let what I had already put in my heart come out. And when I let that come out, they looked at me and goes, I didn't know y'all could say those words. So here I am embarrassed. Here I am hurt. Here I am thinking, oh man, I've just ruined this moment. Do you want to know how I knew I was saved? Because I knew I had to depend on Jesus for my very next step. Aren't you the same way today? Do you know how that you know that you're saved? Because you need Jesus for the next thing you say and do. I went to that person. I did apologize. I said, look, not all of us are morons like Jared, but I was, and this is what, and da, da, da. I didn't excuse it. I just did what I did. And in that conversation, we talked about dependence upon Jesus. And I said, I need him more than I think anybody else does. But they, and they would tell you, you need Jesus more than anybody else does, don't you? But see, here's the real justification. You ready, ladies and gentlemen? It leads to a changed life. Is your life the same as it was when you supposedly prayed a prayer? If it is, we need to have a talk. You're supposed to be changing. Yes, it's true. Jesus does love you the way He found you. But He loves you too much to leave you the way He found you. Nobody in this world that is a good pet owner adopts a pet takes it home, and then treats it terribly just the way they found it. And if you love your pet that way, don't you know how much God loves you? Ladies and gentlemen, justification. It's not just forgiveness. A person can be forgiven and then go right back to doing the old things that they used to do and just be as just as guilty as the day is. But once you've been justified by faith, you're not healthy. Guilty before God. He puts His Spirit in you. You walk in a brand new life. Justification. It's not just a pardon. Some of you might have come today and gone, I just want to be pardoned for the things I've done. Listen, uh, because a pardoned criminal still has a record, you need to know that when a sinner is justified by faith, his past sins, your past sins, her past sins, they are not remembered any longer. God no longer puts your sin on paper. Here's the beauty part. Some of you have thought through it. When I get to heaven and that scroll unrolls, man, they're just going to read off every bad thing I've done. Not every bad thing. Do you know why? Because then you wouldn't have been forgiven. He cast as far the east as to the west. It's wiped clean. Now some of y'all, y'all brought some dirty things with you today. I've got great news for you. There's this thing that happened uh, 2,000 years ago. Jesus put Himself on the cross just so that that dirty thing called sin, it is a sin, it can go bye-bye. You don't have to spend the next 20 years saying I'm sorry for the thing you did 20 years ago. Only God justifies sinner. Nobody else can make you clean. Paul declared that God justifies the ungodly. The reason that most sinners are not justified is that because they won't admit that they're sinners. We typically look at our neighbor and go, well, I'm not as bad as such and such. I'm worse. You've heard me say it before and maybe you can agree. If Paul says he's the chief of sinners, I must be the vice chief. Is that a position? I think that's where I'm at. How about you? We need Jesus now more than ever. And He's here. It's not, dear Jesus, please be with me. He's never left you. His Spirit is in you. The question is, are you going to walk in following Him? Or are you going to continue to slide back into old habits? Now, my last point. It's not a long one, so stay with me. To know that you're justified... You have to trust the work of Jesus on the cross. You can't trust you. Left to yourself, you'll probably do it wrong. Left to yourself, you'll say it wrong and you'll go the wrong place. That's just the nature of things. But to follow the Spirit of God is to be justified. To know that no matter what, you're going to depend on Christ. So what does it look like in 17? It says, but if while... We seek to be justified by Christ. We ourselves are also found sinners. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not, he says. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. 
I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, gave Himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Here's my last point. Again, it's not long, but this is what we need to walk away from. This is the part you also hold on to. Because of Christ, because of Christ, I don't have to build back those old habits. Because of Christ, I don't have to build again what was once there. Ladies and gentlemen, this might come as a surprise to you, but you know those addictions you don't want? You don't have to do them. You know the gossip, the pride, the holding grudges, the lack of forgiveness? You don't have to live like that. It's a choice that you actually are making. You're making the choice to actually do these things. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to sin. Charles Spurgeon said it, and I've said it before. Being a Christian doesn't mean that you're sinless. But it does mean that each day you ought to sin less. If you're still doing the same thing that you did umpteen years ago, have you even asked yourself why you do these things? Maybe your answer is as simple as going, I just want to do it. I just like it. It is what it is. Maybe that's your answer. But then you have to ask your own heart, do I love Jesus enough to do His will over my own? I love Jesus with all my heart. So here's what we say. And this is the part. God, I need Your grace so that I can be forgiven. But I also need Your help not to go back to the old habits. I need Your help. I don't want to be full of all the fear and anxiety. I don't want to be fear, uh, full of all the addictions. I don't want to go back to some of those old things that I used to do. I developed such a mindset that God, I've decided right here and now, right here and now, I need you. Because of old habits, Peter put himself under this impossible way again. And maybe you've come today and your area of making mistakes is razor thin. You've put your life in such a box that you say, if I do or say or whatever else it is, anybody who makes mistakes out of this, they're in trouble. Or maybe you've gone the other way. You've lived such like a heathen in life that we don't even see God in your life. But don't you see what Jesus wants? He wants you to depend on Him and Him alone to be brand new. See, what Paul's argument, he says, Peter, you and I didn't find salvation through the law. We found it in Christ. But now after being saved, you've gone backwards. Today, have you come? Have you gone backwards? Did you lose the joy and the peace you used to have? Have you spent most of your life lately talking about the awesome spiritual moments that you had bunches of years ago and lately you haven't been doing anything? What Paul said is he said, Peter, if this is the way you feel, this means that Christ alone didn't save you. That you needed the law somehow. But Christ then would have made you a sinner. That's what Paul says. He says, Peter, furthermore, if you've preached the gospel of God's grace to the Jews and Gentiles and told them that they're saved by faith and not by keeping the law. He says, by going back into legalism, you're building up what you once tore down. That means you sinned by tearing it down to begin with. And here's the big picture. This is the moment of walking away. You ready? For all of you who told people that they cannot do all these kinds of things in life, as soon as you do them, as soon as you do them, you built back up what wasn't supposed to be done. In this room, I would like to confess to you something simple. I try daily to say the right thing the right way. But sometimes when I get in my car, I call people a fool. But then I remember Jesus told me that's like committing a murder. I don't know how many people I killed on my way to Atlanta. 
Now, I say that with a little humor. I don't mean I actually killed them, right? That's what we would say. But see, this is why we need grace. But how bad would it be if I'm sitting in the fellowship hall with somebody and somebody gets mad and they go, you're a fool. How bad would it be for me to stand up and come over to them and go, hey, you better not say that. You better not do that. That's bad. And then I leave the building and do it. Do you not see what a hypocrite that would be? So many of you were raised by people who said, do what I say and not as I do. But today, the challenge is simple. Are you willing to be somebody who says, Jesus, I need grace and I need your love. But I need a new start. What was Paul doing? He was telling Peter that these old habits are bringing you down. To go back to Moses is to go back to a graveyard. To go back to old habits like worry, pride, Lack of forgiveness, lack of faith. It's a return to the graveyard. Today we want to be saved by faith in Christ, meaning that He died for us. We want to live by faith in Christ, meaning He lives in us. Furthermore, what we need to know as we close is that we're so identified in Jesus Christ that it says with the Spirit that we died in Him. I don't want you to see Jared. I want you to see Jesus in me. I want our life to be such a living example that people do come up to us and say, hey, I'm just kind of curious. Are you a Christian? I, I just want to I just want to ask you a question. You, you have this unnatural happiness. I don't even know how to define it. Right. And then you go, well, let me tell you what's not natural. It's Jesus's love. Jesus put his love right here. And you can have it, too. The Judaizers, they wanted to mix law and grace. Is that what you're doing today? Listen, church, don't set aside the grace of Jesus Christ. You wouldn't have set aside the cure for cancer. For those of you who have leg pain, back pain, when you go to a doctor, if he sat there or she sat there and held the cure in their hands, what would you pay to get some relief? Well, I've got great news for you. Jesus paid everything for us. And for all of you who love a bargain, for all of you who love that word free, don't you want to take that home with you today? Don't you want to live in that freedom today? Again and again, all of us are going to come right up to what Jesus wants. But you have to decide if you're going to turn back or if you're going to live for Him. And this morning, maybe you've come and you've said, you know what, I've listened to this about being justified and I'm not. I've tried to live in law or I've tried to do this and tried to do that and it's not working. And so in just a few moments, we're going to sing a song. But I would love to invite you to come forward and say, I want to be justified. I want to be saved. I'd love to tell you all about what Jesus did. Pray a simple prayer with you and help you understand from this moment on how to live in the forgiveness that Jesus has given. Now, maybe you've come this morning and you say, well, I gave my heart to Jesus years ago. I've been justified for years. Have you slid back into some old habits? Have you gone backwards in your walk? Have you lost your joy? Is peace fallen from you? Is fear taken over? Are there some things in your life you know you shouldn't do? Well, here's this beautiful altar. And I want to invite you to come forward and say, from this moment on, God, I don't want to build back those old habits. I don't want to go under this law area. I don't want to do these things. I want to live for you. And so come. Come to the altar. If you want somebody to pray with, seek me, see others. Take somebody with you and say, come here. Pray with me. I need some help. I need some encouragement. But maybe you've come this morning and you go, you know, I've tried to be a spiritual police. I've tried to come and I've tried to dictate. I've tried to say if they don't do this or else. Ladies and gentlemen, what are we doing? If they need you to tell them all that's bad, then why do they need the Spirit? Maybe you need to come this morning and say, I've tried to be like Peter. 
I tried to tell everybody what to do, even though I was doing it wrong myself. This morning, I want you to know our verse is Mark 2.17. It's a pretty simple one. It's not the well who need a doctor, but the sick. Christ came to be the cure. He is the cure. Do you want it? Yes or no? It's your choice if you want to leave the way you came. But it's also your choice if you want to come to the altar and say from this moment on, I just want to live for you. Will you join me? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, it's time to trust completely in you and you alone. And so God, I know there are those who are asking for healing. There are those who are asking for fresh starts. And there are those who are asking for forgiveness for things that have happened from years past. So meet them where they're at this morning. Meet us at a place and change us from within. Thank you for hearing our prayer. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for listening to the FBC Lloyd podcast. We hope this week's message was encouraging and enlightening. Tune in next week for another uplifting message from Pastor Jared Day. For more information on FBC Lloyd services and events and links to our social media pages, follow the link below in the show notes. God bless you and have a great week.